Good morning. about this. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So it is now 9.15 according to my clock and we can start. So today I'm going to be exploring uh, more basic things. So on, I'm, I'm kind of trying to build a library for people because I know a lot of people cannot watch at the exact time um, live, and then when you go to look at the uh, recorded versions, maybe you uh, are needing a particular thing, and then you can choose among the different offerings. So to the, on Tuesday, I was doing a more intermediate level class with not very much explanation and instruction, and today I'm going to go the other extreme and really dive in to um, a lot of basic things, which will be great for someone who's never done yoga before, but also if you are a very advanced yoga practitioner, maybe some of the stuff has become a little rote. And in the, um, in the Zen tradition, there's this concept called beginner's mind. And the idea is that you, can, you should always be able to go back to that idea of what it was like in the beginning. So some of you eventually watching this maybe have actually never done a downward dog. And those of you who've done a million downward dogs, see if as you go into your first downward dog this morning, you can experience it as though you've never experienced it before. That's the idea of the beginner's mind. So hopefully this will have something to offer people all along the, um, the yoga spectrum. So let us begin. Um, I, uh, I forgot to say I'm Aaron Riley and my yoga studio here in Wellesley is Personal Day Yoga. I'm uh, on the web at personalday.net and on Facebook at Personal Day Yoga. I have a page there and, um, uh, and then on YouTube you can find me here. And you can subscribe to the channel if you want to get notices of when I'm doing another live stream and what the uh, topic is. Okay, so um, the the fundamental thing about yoga, and just find a comfortable way to sit, and that, that's a pretty fundamental thing right there. Yoga actually was developed as a method of preparing for meditation. So that blissful feeling you feel at the end of a yoga class, that is meant to segue you right into a uh, calm, quiet, meditative practice. Um, and open up your hips and make you feel strong enough and supple enough to sit comfortably enough for a little while. The optimum way to sit, and you can do it however you want, is with your spine straight and your thighs at about this angle relative to your torso. So you can be sitting on a block, you can be sitting on a little meditation stool, the meditation stool is designed to be exactly that. You can sit on the edge of a chair, with your knees a little bit lower and, and spine tall. And then when you're sitting on the ground, you should sit on something, if you're sitting cross-legged, sit on something that lifts your hips. So again, your torso relative to your thighs is approximately this angle. So I don't know what that is. Maybe 135, something like that. Um, and you'll notice, hopefully, that you can get comfortable this way. So find a way to be comfortable while we chat for just a moment about um, the other fundamental aspect of yoga, which is breathing. So the idea with the yoga breath is that it's in through the nose, out through the nose. Every once in a while, you can have it go in and out through, uh, um, out through your mouth with a cleansing breath, like a And the idea is to have your breath be the guide for your practice. So um, in some yoga classes, I notice that the teachers will say, inhale, do this, exhale, do that, inhale, do this. And uh, the tendency is for everybody to inhale when the teacher says inhale. What I suggest you do in my classes and in any other class or your own practice is pay attention to the sensor in your brain that tells you, I need oxygen now. That initiates your inhalation and that should initiate your movement. And then when you're going into a deeper pose, the, the stretching part of the pose or the, the difficult part of the pose, maybe lowering into a push-up, um, 
that's when you wait for the signal in your brain that says, ooh, I need to let this, these waste products out. I need to exhale. And when you feel that, that's when you start to do that subsequent movement. So I will be saying things like, when you need to inhale next, or when your next exhale comes around, do such and such. And um, it's gonna really transform how you do yoga if you're used to switching your breath to match someone else's needs. Um, the result is sometimes you're gonna be way ahead of the person who's leading you, and sometimes you might be lagging behind. Just trust in yourself that it'll all work out. And if you're ahead, you can take a couple of breaths in one pose. If you're behind, do not rush. Maybe you skip one of the poses and just join up later. So um, the breath is the fundamental thing. It's what differentiates a lot of uh, exercises from the yoga and the benefits you can get from yoga, the calming benefits, the nerve uh, calming benefits. So um, you're going to be paying attention to your breath throughout the practice and um, try to get that beginner's mind if you're not actually a beginner. So some things you might find useful is if you have a couple of yoga blocks or something that can uh, substitute for them, um, a couple of big books or you know soup cans, sometimes people can use something like that. For the end of the class, I like to have something to put under my legs. I've got a bean bag that you can use pillows or couch cushions or whatever, something to cover you. I have a light sheet, but you can use a blanket. And then something to cover your eyes. You can use um, a small towel or an eye pillow if you have one, or even a sock if that's lying around. And finally, um, a strap is useful, especially if you're beginning your journey in yoga and some parts of you are tighter that you might not be able to reach something. So um, if you don't have a strap, you can use a tie, or if you are, have a martial arts person in your house, you can use their, one of their belts, or, um, or use a, a belt you know, that you would wear around your waist. And then finally, um, a small cushion. We're probably not going to use it today, but um, or maybe I will. It's a useful thing when you're sitting on the floor sometimes to be able to get your hips into a comfortable position. So um, I also have some water here. So if you're practicing, you might have that as a part of your toolkit. And I am playing some music here. You'll find music can be transformative for your practice. So if you are feeling like you need a little energy, just like any other time, um, if you put on some more energetic music, you'll find that it gives you a little more energy and you're going to start to move a little bit more. If you are all up in your head and you're all frazzled and you need something calming, you can put on some calming music. And um, there's a lot of yoga playlists on Spotify or there's CDs and things like that that are a compilation of things that kind of lead you through um, the, the rhythm of a yoga practice, maybe starting calm, building up to a high, more high energy and then lowering you down. Um, so you can do that and then it kind of fine tunes your practice to your energy level throughout the day. So we've got some music, we've got some props, we've got our breathing, we have our beginner's mind. So let's begin. Okay, so we're going to start standing up. Uh, the standing, oh, and the other thing is a mat, of course. My mat is round so I can show things at different angles. Um, if you have a yoga mat, it's more likely a rectangle. Whenever I'm standing over the edge like this, it's you would be standing up the front edge of your mat where it's um, at the short end, facing the short end. Um, some people are using a beach towel or something like that. You just want something where you're not going to slip too much if you're in a warrior position. You don't want your feet to go out from under you. So um, it also works well just you know on a wood floor. can can work well especially if you haven't mopped it in a long time and it's a little stickier. Um, okay, so once again, we're going to come to the front of the mat, so at the short end, and stand tall, and just breathe. So take a couple of breaths here, and you're just noticing that your body tells you when you need to inhale, when you need to exhale. You don't have to think about it too much. You don't have to order it to do it, but just notice it when it happens because, as I said, that's going to be the thing that leads you into the next movement throughout our time together today. And you're going to notice that that will make our, our this, this hour here um, a much more beneficial one to your mental state, which we all need right now, right? Okay, so you're standing up tall. This is called mountain pose. The classic mountain pose, your hands would be out to the side like this, so it gives you a slight opening in the front of your chest. And it's the most basic pose, and it's kind of nice because you can doesn't really look like a yoga pose, and you can sneak it in almost anywhere. But you'll notice that when people are standing around in life, they rarely stand like this, especially if your palms facing open. But 
rarely stand like this. Most of the time they're standing like this, whatever. So you can you can work in a little bit of yoga just by doing this and breathing. Very unobtrusive, no one can notice, and you can transform something right there. So that's like basic yoga one on one. Mountain pose, also called tadasana in uh, Sanskrit. So from the mountain pose, you're going to just lift your arms over your head, another classic pose. Notice how your lungs have a lot more room in them now. You've lifted up, expanding your rib cage in this direction. Take a couple of breaths here, again just noticing. You can be pretending that you're holding on to something up above your head and dangling down. If you've got kids with you today, you can pretend you're on a jungle gym, or you can pretend you're a monkey hanging from a branch, breathing there. And sometime when you feel the need to exhale, we're just going to fold forward. So here's another very basic pose, but I could spend a long time talking about this. So if you look at what I'm doing for a moment, you'll see that I'm doing what's called hip hinging. So I am not attempting to get my fingertips to the floor no matter what, rounding like this and just trying to get them there like that. Instead, I'm staying upright, keeping this tall posture and hinging right my hips where the, where the leg bone comes into my pelvis. You can even put your fingers there and pretend that you've got a hinge there and that you can't bend your upper body. So some people's hamstrings are going to stop them, maybe even up here. But that is a good stretch for you, much better than doing this and trying to get your fingertips somewhere. So right at your hips, hinging, and you just keep going. Maybe you're pairing the descent with an exhalation so that you're using that relaxation response to lower down. And then you, some people will be able to go a little bit further. Just go to wherever you can with the hinge, straight back, and just let your fingers be wherever they're going to be. So again, some people might be up here and getting a stretch. Some people here. And breathe there. Another little fundamental thing about, and you can stay in your pose, um, is that when you are stretching one muscle, so we're stretching the hamstrings right now, if you engage the muscle that does the opposing action, you're going to get a little more opening in your muscle. Again, going back to the brain, your hamstring muscle is designed to bend your knee, or that's its job, I should say, to, be to bend your knee joint. And then your quadricep muscle is designed to straighten your knee joint. So if you really straighten your knee joint and you, your brain is sending that signal, okay, quadricep, engage, engage, straighten your knee, then at the same time, it sends a signal to your hamstrings to let go because our brains are pretty smart and they know that if both of them are tense at the same time, they're going to be fighting each other. So the more you engage your quadricep muscle when you're trying to stretch your hamstrings, the more opening you'll get. You can play around with that. And the last thing I'll say about forward bends or folds is that, of course, if you're feeling super tight or feeling any kind of discomfort or anything, a slight bend in the knees where you're letting go of that engagement in your quadricep muscle is, of course, perfectly wonderful. So you're either having a slight bend in your knees if you're feeling some tension or discomfort, or you're really straightening your legs, trying to get that um, releasing effect in the hamstrings by engaging your quads. So you're in your forward fold, probably too long because I've been talking, but as, as I said, this class is going to be all about that. And then we're going to go back to a lunge. So you're going to take your left foot to the back of the mat. And here's where the blocks can come in useful. So if it's not comfortable for you to be with your fingertips on the floor, your hands can be up on blocks. Or like I said, you can use some, some uh, books or boxes or whatever, something just to get you elevated a little bit. And um, other thing that I'll say about props in general is that some people think that using a prop is cheating. Um, but I find that using props can really enhance the practice, even if you're a super advanced yoga practitioner. So here, my hands are, fingertips are to the floor, and I'm getting a certain kind of stretch. But if I come up onto the blocks and I lift up this way, I'm actually getting a bigger stretch in my left front hip flexor. So you can enhance things with the blocks, and it's not just um, you know feeling like you're giving up. But if you are using the blocks, you're going to move them out of the way now so you can get your hands to the floor and take your right foot back to meet your left. And here we are, our first downward dog of our lives, all of us. Let's do it together. So you're lifting your hips high, dropping your heels low, spreading out your fingers. I'll show you here. 
spreading out your fingers as far away from each other as you can get them, and pressing into your whole hand. So some people tend to do their downward dog like this. I can show you. Oh, here, if your hands, if this is my mat, and your hand is kind of crunched up like that, and you're pressing into it, you're going to get um, discomfort in your wrists after a short amount of time. So you want to have your hands spread out and your whole hand supporting you, all of these bones supporting you, not cupped up like that and dumping all the weight onto your wrist. So that's a fundamental thing for any time you're on your hands, downward dog, any kind of arm balances, anything like that. So your hands are nicely spread out and you're lifting your hips high and you're in your downward dog. You can relax your neck down. Come out of it anytime you like if you need a break, just coming down onto your knees. And you can sit like this, because I'm going to chat about downward dog for a few more moments. So maybe um, you want to take a break or you want to see what I'm talking about. Um, so downward dog, one of the things that people do a lot, again, if hamstrings are limited and feeling tight, what's going to happen is in the attempt to do downward dog, quote unquote, right, people straighten their legs. But if your hamstrings don't have the length to allow your hips to lift high, then you're going to be rounded like this and your back is going to be rounded and your line between your hands and your hips will be more of a curve rather than a straight line. Now there's nothing terrible about the curve except that to me, the main benefit of downward dog is that it's the only pose where you are bearing weight on your arms and get to really lengthen through your shoulder joint and lengthen your spine in a straight line. So for a lot of people to get that benefit, you're going to let go of the attempt to also stretch your legs at the same time because there's a million ways to stretch your hamstrings. You can do that in a lot of different ways. You don't need to be doing it here. Instead, let your knees bend a lot, and that will give a little more um, mobility to your hips. And then you can do your long straight line, resting your weight onto your whole hand and getting the benefit of downward dog, feeling it in your chest, feeling the strength building. The other thing I'll say, going back to the beginner's mind, and feel free to stay in it or come out of it. Um, when I first started doing yoga, and I was pretty strong, and I had been doing gymnastics for a long time in my life. I had taken a big pause, but I remember being in downward dog, and the teacher saying, and now we're going to rest in downward dog and stay here for five breaths. And my arms were so tired, and I thought, how can this be a resting pose? Um, so I totally remember that beginner's mind yoga for me of um, the downward dog being really challenging. So if you're finding it the same way, just know that if you keep at it, these particular muscles that are used to support you will get stronger and it will become a very um, resting, uh, rejuvenating pose for you rather than the, the hard work that it might feel right now. Okay, so that was a lot of lottery about downward dog, but I want to make sure since it's a pose that is done so many times in yoga classes, that you are getting the full benefit of it with your knees bent. Okay, so now you can let your knees go a little straighter because now we're gonna to move to plank pose. Most of us are gonna to have to move your toes back a little bit and then come forward because otherwise, if you're in your downward dog and you just come forward, you're gonna end up with your shoulders in front of your wrist and you might feel that the inner wrist crease or the inner wrist is getting some tension on it. And again, you don't want yoga to be hurting you especially if you're going to be doing it often. So you want to, if you find that your shoulders are out in front of your wrist, just scooch your toes back, either before you come into the plank pose or now, and press into the floor again with your whole hand. Now you can see it really well. So you can be staying in this nice long line from your heels to your shoulders. Anytime you start to feel like you're losing the, the integrity and the connection between your legs and your torso, you're starting to sag a little bit, Rather than letting yourself sag, just let your knees come to the floor and refine the engagement now between your knees and your shoulder, that straight line. So if you're up here more like a hands and knees position, you're not going to feel the challenge. You can just keep sliding forward until you feel your low belly working and you can stay there. So going back to the notion of the breath, we're going to utilize the exhale to lower to the floor. So many people hold their breath when they're doing that, and it just makes it harder. So you're either on your knees or you're on your toes. You're noticing when your lungs are full, and then when you need to exhale, you're going to time your exhale with the lower end to the floor. And now you're on your, on your belly. Great. 
So now we have several options for what I call front body openers. Um, it's also known as a back bend, but the emphasis here is really on opening your, your front body. So when you're doing the front body openers, your choices are you can be very low to the floor, keeping a, a perhaps a injured or tweaky back safe, and you slowly can rise up. So you can be here almost like a back body crunch, lifting up just using the muscles in your back. You can take your hands off the floor to challenge yourself that way, feel your back muscles working. You can put your hands down onto the floor and come a little higher using your arm strength and your back strength. Now what happens here a lot of times is people, when they're pushing into their arms, they lift up. Let me show it this way. So you're, you're, you're lifting up, and then as soon as you start to push into your arms, your shoulders come up around your ears with you. So what I'm gonna suggest is that you lower your elbows down, maybe pull them in a little bit. Keep your elbows lowering even as you lift up. So showing it from the side again. Lifting up with just your back muscles. Now adding on the arms, keeping your elbows low, shoulders low, as you lift into whatever version of Cobra you wanna be doing. And then the, uh, the last one that you can do, well actually there's also Sphinx. So Sphinx, you would be on your forearm with your elbow right under your shoulder and kind of relaxing into it there because you're not having to use arm strength, you're just propping up. For some people, this is too deep a back bend, and if that's the case, but you still want to do a version of Sphinx, you can move your arms a little bit away so you're not up as high, but you still want to keep your shoulders dropping low, not dropping in pressure on your neck. And then the last one, which is for more um, intermediate or, or advanced practitioners, so you can watch if you have any issues with your back, but I would not suggest doing this one. So you're gonna bring your hands right next to your low ribs and see how my arms are kind of in a right angle to the floor. My, my um, forearms are pretty much up and down. And once again, I'm spreading out my whole hand using my whole hand, spreading out my fingers. I'm gonna press the tops of my feet into the floor, lift up, just like I did before, and then keeping your shoulders away from your ears, you press into the floor to lift up. Your knees and hips are off the floor. And then you're pulling your shoulder blades toward each other, gazing forward, or maybe looking up and getting a throat stretch. So this is upward facing dog, of the classic pose. I'm gonna lower back to the floor. And now um, when you're on the floor, what you wanna to do to come back up, couple choices, you can just press up, under your hands and knees. If you wanna work on building upper body strength, because this is a move that you do over and over and over in yoga class, you can practice doing a push up to lift up. So keeping your knees on the floor, try lifting up in a knee push up, or if you have the core and arm strength, you can try lifting up with your whole body. So however you do it, hands and knees, or one of the planks, you're gonna to come to here, your toes are tucked, and now we're going to our second ever downward dog in our lives. So again, checking with your hands, filling up with your breath, and as you're emptying, lift your hips, maybe you're keeping your knees bent, enjoying the length in your torso, breathing there, feeling the challenge in your arms if you are truly doing this for the first time. And then we're gonna bring your right foot up to the front. Sorry, the left foot up to the front. So here's another big challenge in the yoga class. So again, these moves that I'm doing right now are something that are done over and over and over again in yoga class, especially a vinyasa class, if you've ever heard the term vinyasa yoga. That just means a particular sequence of poses. And in the Western yoga tradition, vinyasa has come to mean this series of things that I'm showing you right now. So people use it to link poses together. And so you're going to do it again and again. So there's opportunities, as I said, to build strength because you're going to be doing things over and over and over. There's opportunities to injure yourself if you do it improperly, which is why I'm emphasizing the hand positioning. Um, and then there's also opportunities to um, build in some stretching. So from the downward dog getting up to the front of the mat, there's a bunch of ways of doing it. There's one yoga tradition, Ashtanga yoga, where you jump from the back of the mat up to the front. I actually never do that. It, it looks like this, you would bend your knees and jump up forward like that. I don't do that one because to me, I'm missing the opportunity to do the lunge. 
So the way to get from the back of the mat up to the front of the mat, this way, a few ways of doing it. The easiest way is to, I'm gonna bring my left foot forward, put your right knee down on the ground, move your left hand out of the way, bring your foot around, and there you are. Then you tuck your toes in the back, and you're in the lunge with your left foot in the front. So that's, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is you bring your foot forward, and I'm, I'm coming up onto my left fingertips. I'll show you here. Coming up onto my left fingertips. I have short arms, and so if my hands are both on the floor, I have a hard time getting my foot through. But if I get myself a little extra space, I can bring my foot forward. So you can try that too. Another little trick. For a lot of people, they'll bring their foot forward and they get it to about here, and then it gets stuck. What you can try doing is bring your hand behind your ankle, move weight over into your right hand so you get some space, and then try scooching it forward like that. And then the other way of doing it is kind of fun. If you have this in your, in your practice or you want to try it, you can take your left leg up in the air. This is called three-legged dog. And then try bringing your foot all the way to the front from here. So you get a little momentum. Again, I'm coming up onto my left fingertips, lifting up, using my core muscles to bring my leg up and through and then sliding it through. So for a lot of people, the last few versions are not uh, accessible. So this one, putting your knee down and bring your foot around, is a great way to get your foot up to the proper place up at the front of the mat. And then once you're here, you're either on the floor, hands on blocks, enjoy the opening of your hips, and then we're going to come to the front of the mat. So let's tune in with the breath again and use your inhale to press off and come up to the front. And then your exhale to hinge at your hips and feel the stretch in the backs of your legs, maybe engaging your quads to enhance that, maybe giving your legs a little break, however you're going to be. So a couple of breaths here. Again, notice your breathing cycle. And when you are going to inhale, use that time to ride up to standing. You bring your arms overhead again. And now this is something that I like to do in my sun salutation, my thing, repetitive movement that often happens in yoga classes, is I bring my hands down the center on an exhale. And to me, again, this is more particular to my uh, yoga practice. I've not noticed a lot of other teachers doing this, but um, it gives an opportunity to, in many levels, come back to center. So you're exhaling, you're kind of resetting, you're dragging your hands down your center. I'll stand in the center of my mat for this. Bring your hands down the center. And uh, the other way I can, you can think of it is, I like to think of it as I'm reaching out, I'm grabbing something that I need in, in me, and I'm pulling it down into me. And then as I'm going along, I'm pulling out things I don't need and let them go. So this motion, again, that we're going to do again and again and again in the class, um, you can use it to reset your mental state, find your, your center, feel your feet down on the ground, find your breath, and um, it can just be like a little uh, Pavlovian uh, response that you get when you do this one move each time. So there's an opportunity there if you want to do that. So that was a lot of talking and a lot of explaining. What we're going to do now is that whole series, which is called the sun salutation, and flow through it a little bit more. Um, and so when, for example, we get to the floor and I say now choose a front body opener, you're going to choose the cobra or the sphinx or the upward dog, etc. When we're in downward dog, you're going to choose if your legs are going to be bent or straight, etc. Okay, so standing in mountain pose, breathing in, exhaling whatever is going to happen for you. One of these times when your breath is coming in, raise your arms overhead, and then let's, on your exhalation, down to the floor. So now the right foot will go back to the mat, the back of the mat first, you're in your lunge, and let's all find that beginner's mind, spreading out your fingers, supporting with your whole hand as the left leg comes back, and you move into your downward dog, taking advantage of the stretch through your shoulders and spine primarily, and then you're going to, on an inhale, Come forward to plank, remembering to move your feet back so that your shoulders are stacked over your wrists and there's no tension in your wrists. Your legs are up or down, knees on the floor. As you, on your exhale, lower to the floor. And then you're going to pick a way to open up your front with your shoulders dropping, chest rising, 
shoulder blades moving toward each other, feeling the strength in your back and the openness in your front. As you exhale, lower down. And then use the next inhale to come up in a way that works for you. And exhaling back to the downward dog again. So now's the opportunity to practice the bringing your foot forward with the right leg. So maybe the left knee goes down and you bring the right foot around, or maybe your right leg is going up into the air for three-legged dog before it comes forward. Remember the little trick to come onto your fingertips if that's helpful to you. Lunging here, and then bringing your left foot up to the front, filling up with air, and as you empty out, hinging at your hips, feeling the stretch. So the thing about yoga, actually let's come up standing on your inhale, and use whatever imagery is gonna be helpful to you as you bring your hands down the center. And back up. And then bring your hands down and pause at your heart for a moment. Great. Um, one other thing I'll say about the hands at the heart thing here is um, for some people, they are concerned that yoga is somehow contradictory with um, a religious practice that they might have. And while it is true that there are people who are um, Hindus and who, who practice yoga, and that's where it originally came from, that um, the, well, this, there's been books written about this, so I won't go into it too much, but the West has certainly secularized yoga. Um, this prayer pose is something that, um, and I've said this many times, when people say namaste to each other in India, it's their way of saying hello. It literally means the divine in me sees the divine in you, but in the same way that when we say goodbye, that used to be God be with you, and it's been contracted to just goodbye. And so when you say God be with you, you're not necessarily saying something religious in our culture. And in the same way, namaste is not um, really religious, so it's not going to be conflicting with some uh, belief system that you might be having. So if in a yoga class someone says namaste, you can think of it as the special thing in me or the light in me recognizes the special thing or the light in you. So that's what this uh, prayer pose is, or this prayer hands. And it can come in very handy these days when we're not allowed to um, you know, touch each other or hug each other or shake hands. So this can be a very meaningful way to connect with someone. So the special thing in me sees a special thing in you. Um, what I was going to say uh, more generally about yoga poses as we get into something, some things that are maybe a little more challenging um, this morning, is that yoga is not about the outside, it's about the inside. So I've said this many times that it might look like Someone whose forward fold looks like this is not really, you know, like good at yoga. But then I, because I've, you know, been flexible my whole life and I'm naturally flexible and I've worked at it, I can come all the way down here. And that seems like, ooh, wow, she's really flexible. She's good at yoga. The thing is, when I'm here, it, it's a nice stretch, but I'm not having to think about it. I'm not having to breathe. I'm not having to do all these things. I, I can just kind of do it. Whereas if somebody is here, and they are concentrating, and they are breathing in, breathing out through the nose or mouth, really focusing on what's happening in your body, focusing on what's happening in your mind, and are you are, are thoughts bubbling up about how, oh, you know, this is so hard, and I'm never going to be able to touch the floor, and can you overcome those thoughts? That's the yoga. So it doesn't matter how it looks from the outside. It's what's going on inside that makes you an advanced yogi or not. So that's something to bear in mind. So let's now do a couple of um, sort of very foundational standing poses that you would encounter in a lot of yoga classes. And um, for the sake of time, I'm going to just step into them as you would in, um, if you've ever had, heard of Iyengar yoga. In Iyengar yoga classes, you're more likely to just do what I did and just you know, take a step back and then be in a pose. Whereas in a vinyasa class, you would be doing the whole thing we just did and then bring your foot forward to get into a pose like this. So, uh, we're going to do the warrior poses. So warrior one, we'll start with because it's number one. I'm going to have you stand at the front of your mat and have your feet separated about a few inches so that your legs are pretty much straight up and down for you. Okay? You're going to keep the right leg exactly where it is and spin your left foot out to the side at about 45 degree angle. Notice how your hips and your ribcage and your shoulders can still be facing toward the front. You're going to try to keep all that 
as you take your, your uh, left foot and slide it back till it lands at the back of the mat, still at that 45 degree angle. Now notice I have this um, line in the middle of my mat. One foot is on one side of the line, the other foot is on the other side of the line. I've got that same distance between my feet. It's gonna make it easier to keep my shoulders and my, or my hips and my ribcage and my shoulders facing forward as I go to the warrior one. So that's the issues to be thinking about in this orientation. Now I'm gonna show you from the side. Again, I'm here, I pivot my foot, I step back, and I'm here. So you can have both legs straight. The left foot is at that angle in the back, and I'm trying to orient toward the front, the short end of my mat. Now, when both legs are straight, it's easier to have your shoulders over your rib cage, over your hips. What happens a lot of times is as people bend the front knee, so we're bending the right leg, you tend to, people tend to lean forward here. Now, this is not a horrible thing because it's not a situation where you're going to hurt yourself. In fact, this is kind of can be a pose. But to get the benefit from this pose, the benefit for me is in the left front hip. So to get that, you want to press up, trying to find, even with your bit leg bent, that same stacking as much as you can. You'll notice as you do that that you feel more of a stretch in the front of your left hip. And then for your arms, they can just be relaxing down. They can be wide open like a T, or the classic pose is your arms overhead. I'll show you again this orientation. And again, if your leg is starting to get tired because you're not used to holding it, a pose like this, your muscles aren't used to doing this position, then you can just come up for a little break. And if you're still in it, or if your leg is straight, you can still practice the arms. So again, the tendency for a lot of people is, I wanna get my fingers as high as they'll go and everything lifts up. See if you can keep your fingers lifting high, but slide your shoulder blades down your back. My first yoga teacher, every time she walked by me, she would say, shoulder blades down the back, shoulder blades down the back, became my mantra. So you can either stay with your leg bent, working on the upper body version of this, or try bending your knee again in the front, the left knee, or the right knee, sorry, and breathing there, warrior one. So benefits here are you're building strength, it's a little bit of a balanced pose. You're getting a, you're stretching it in your uh, left hip, breathing there. So we'll turn this into warrior two by, now see this line? I'm gonna now put both of my feet on the line. So I can walk my foot over to the big toe side and pop my other foot back a little bit. So now I'm on like a, a balance beam and my hips are turned to the side, rib cage, shoulders. Turn to the side. Now what happens here, and this is an issue with safety, a lot, a lot, a lot of times, I've seen it many, many times, people will turn to the side and their knee does that. Not a big deal, it doesn't hurt right now, right? But if you do this over and over again, it will start to damage your knee. So you wanna make sure that your knee is pointing straight toward your middle toes. You wanna be able to see your big toe on the inside of your knee. And you're just gonna bend until your knee is over your ankle. So you don't want to have a short stance and be bending like this where your knee is way in front of your ankle. That will also cause some damage in your knee over time. So for some people, the stance is going to be short. Knee stacked over ankle and arms out to the side. Other people, you have your legs a little further away from each other and you might be working toward getting your thigh more parallel to the floor coming down. But there's nothing magical about this. Again, someone who has done this a million times and isn't even thinking about it, may look like they're like super yogi, but they're not doing as much yoga as someone who's very mindfully doing this. So be a mindful super yogi, inner super yogi, and be where you need to be. So that's warrior two. Let's take a break now, just coming out of that. For warrior three, um, we're still going to be on the right leg, wearing it out. <laughs> and warrior three is a balance pose. So you can start in warrior, uh, in what's called crescent lunge. So let's take the um, left foot back again. I'm on that wide balance beam, so my feet are on either side of an imaginary line on my mat. And then take my arms up overhead. And remember before when I was saying how if you lean forward, there's no thing wrong with it. That's actually the preparation for warrior three. So 
Don't go into it yet if you've never done this before. Just watch for a second and see what I do, because you cannot be doing the pose and looking to see what's going on. So you're here in your crescent lunge, coming forward. Notice how I've made a line from my heel to my fingers, one straight line. You're going to try to just tip that over. So I hop forward a little bit, more weight comes into my right foot, and then I start to lift my back leg. Now, some people, you're going to keep your toes on the ground. Some people, your legs are just going to hump a little bit off the ground. Others will be able to tip until your foot is the same level as your hands, and you're tipping over like making a T on the floor. So this is warrior three. You can have your arms out in front, variations, arms out in a T. If your hands are back by your hips, that's called airplane pose. And then to come out of it, you can just come and stand. So we've learned... Warrior one, warrior two, and warrior three. Those are foundational standing poses. You might notice, as I mentioned in some classes um, earlier, this uh, this session, these sessions, that doing these poses, you can really get your heart rate up. And I'm just doing everything on this tiny little circle. And I don't need to have a gym. I don't need to have a, you know a trail. Just with a little bit of space and a little bit of activity, you can really get some nice um, heart heart um, exercise and also working on the balance and the calming all at the same time. That's one of the reasons I love yoga. I feel like it's one-stop shopping. So connect with your breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let's try one of those sun salutations again, and then we'll come and do the other side um, with the standing poses. So this, this will be a little bit more like what you would do in a vinyasa class. So rising up with your inhale. Taking your hands down the center, pulling in something good. Next, you exhale. And then when you're inhaling, your arms rise. And then fingertips to the floor again. And now your left foot reaches all the way to the back. And we're going to do warrior one. Oh, sorry, your right foot reaches to the back. And we're going to do warrior one on the other side. So now your left leg is out in front. You're going to hop your toes in the back, out to the side, and let your heel come down and coming up. So in the back, my foot is at an angle in the front, and the toes are closer to the front end of the mat, heel closer to the back end of the mat. Front toes are pointing straight ahead. I'm lifting up tall, stacking my torso, and my arms can come up overhead, shoulder blades dropping down, filling up with air. As I exhale, I allow my front knee to bend, but I keep my torso lifting. So I'm not just dumping everything into my front leg. Warrior one, breathing. And then to turn this into warrior two. You can bring your hands to the center, bring your front foot over. So now it's in line with your back foot. Maybe you're adjusting the distance between your feet. And then your arms can go out horizontally, one in front, one in back. Again, lowering your knee to whatever is a good challenge for you without letting your knee cave in toward your big toe side. Keep it pointing straight to your middle toes. You can even think about pressing your knee into your right hand, or your left hand. Warrior two. Again, not letting your knee come in front of your ankle. So not there, keeping it stacked right above it. And now to go to warrior three, you can come onto your back toes, bring your arms up again, and create the line a long straight line from your heel to your fingers. Gazing down at the floor, start to move forward, move weight into your front foot, lifting your back leg, whatever height is going to work for you. A few breaths there. Choosing an arm position, arms in front, out to the side or back, and then bending your leg, coming to standing. Great. Inhaling, arms overhead. Exhaling, hands down the center. Once again, arms overhead on your inhale. And as you exhale, pause at your heart. Another big thing about yoga is that it does have different poses, have different effects on different people. And the best thing you can do is treat your time doing yoga as a science experiment. So you do something, and then you pause, and you see what it did. You don't have to quite go to keeping a lab notebook, but it might actually be a useful thing if you jot down, like, oh, that made me feel really calm, or oh, that pose gave me a lot of energy, or oh, I noticed when I do that pose, my back doesn't hurt. You know, if you keep track of these effects, 
then you can use them. I've been saying all along, you can be building a yoga toolbox and you can go to that toolbox whenever you need something. And just like a, a, a carpenter would choose a Phillips head or a, a flathead screwdriver, you choose what poses are going to do what you need to do at any given time. Okay, so we've, we've done a lot of standing poses. Now um, we'll come down to the floor for our last little bit together. And I'm going to talk about forward folds on the floor because this is another whole series of poses that people do where they might be injuring themselves. So this is a time when a little cushion might be useful. It can be any kind of throw pillow or whatever. This one happens to be have some beans in it. Um, so when you're sitting on the floor, that whole little chat I gave before about the standing forward fold, imagine the floor is here, okay? So the blocks are the floor. And that same discussion I gave where the object is not at whatever it costs to get your fingers to that floor. The object is to stretch your hamstrings, right? So the way you do that is your hamstrings are attached um, behind your knees and they're also attached onto your sit bones. So what you want to do is your knees are going to be where they are. You want to get your sit bones as far away from your knees as your hamstrings will let you. So a lot of times yoga teachers will say, you know, move the flesh out of the way. What you're really doing is you're tipping your pelvis and moving your sit bone back. So think about your frontal hip bones here in the front of your hips going forward as your sit bones move back. So if you have flexible hamstrings, you're going to be able to sit up tall and have a, a little bit of a curve in your low back when you're sitting on the floor. If your hamstrings are tighter, you're not going to be able to tip your pelvis that way and you're going to be sitting like this and it's going to be pretty uncomfortable and, and starting to reach forward can actually be a little bit dangerous for your low back. This is where the cushion comes in. So you're going to take the cushion or a block, and I'm actually going to show it with a block. Um, so what happens with some people is they say, oh, okay, I'm going to sit up on the block. And then they sit up on the block, and then they do the exact same thing. So the block or the cushion is there to help you tip your pelvis. So it's a little bit easier to feel on a block. You scooch forward until your sit bones go off the edge of the block, and then it allows your pelvis to tilt, and then you can sit up tall. So see if you can get something in your house that allows you to do that where you can sit, and all of a sudden you feel a curve in this direction in your low back, not curving outward. Okay, so that's gonna be a safe way to do your forward folds. So whether you're up on a block, or on the floor, or on a cushion, what you want to do when you're doing your forward folds, again, forward fold, the idea is to stretch your hamstrings. I'm going to do this on a block, I mean on a cushion to show you. The idea is to stretch your hamstrings. So you want to have your sit bones moving back and your, your heels moving forward, and then your frontal hip bones moving toward your thigh bones. That's the whole thing. Doesn't matter what's happening up here. Okay, so the focus here. Remember before in Downward Dog, I said there's a tons of ways to stretch your hamstrings. This is the way to stretch your hamstrings. You can leave downward dog for strengthening and stretching through your shoulders and your spine. So once again here though, you can use that trick of engaging your quadriceps to have your brain release your hamstrings a little bit more by pressing the backs of your legs into the floor. So really straighten your legs, make your quadriceps firm, and you might notice you can tip a little further. You get a little more space in your hamstrings. Again, I am fully aware that many people are gonna be right here. As long as you're stretching your hamstrings, you're getting the benefit of the pose and as long as you're being mindful, not judging yourself, breathing, you're doing really advanced yoga. Okay. Now, having said all that, if you want to, once you've gotten as far as you can go, getting your hamstrings as long as they're going to go, then another potential offering from a forward fold is a stretch in your back, and you can round down. But do it from that safe place. Not with the ambition about where your fingers are, but just now thinking about rounding in your back. You can tuck your chin into your chest. You can let your elbows drop toward the floor and find more space between your shoulder blades. And then let your breath fill up into your back. This is a nice time to let a breath out through your mouth. And whenever you want to, when you're inhaling, you can come back up, either unfurling from your rounding or just hinging up. And that's a great way to stretch uh, the backs of your legs. 
So I'm just going to quickly show you the same thing applies if you're in a straddle. Again, some people might be here. Sit up on a cushion or a block. And then again, the frontal hip bones going toward the floor, hinging. Same idea, just you're stretching more the inner thighs rather than the, um, the hamstrings. And coming up. Great. So now let's get back to stretching the front of the body again in a bridge pose. So this is a great pose because we spend so much time like this, hunched over, holding a phone, head down. This is going to help you to open your chest, open things up. So again, if you've never done this before, watch for a moment before you lie on your back. If you've done this a million times, you can go ahead and lie down, but still try to create that inner, uh, that beginner's mind in, in, inside and experience it as though for the first time. So you're going to lie down on your back. And in order to protect your low back, I suggest that you press your low back into the floor and feel the work that your belly has to do to do that. Keep that work going as you lift yourself off the floor. So you're going to bring your heels in close to your bottom and about a little bit wider than your hips, so about there. And then you engage your low belly, press your feet into the floor, start to lift your hips up. So with your align between your knees and your hips and your shoulders kind of straight, then that's one version of the bridge pose. And as I said, if you haven't done this before, please watch from sitting up because once you're in bridge pose, I don't want you turning your head side to side because you can um, injure your neck. Your nose should be pointing straight up. If you need to look around, just use your eyeballs. So uh, you're going to be making a straight line from your shoulders to your hips to your knees as the first point, then in just like doing cobra pose on the floor where you were using your back muscles, you're going to use your back muscles again to create that shape. So your uh, breastbone will come closer and closer and closer into your chin. And now you can start to move your shoulder blades toward each other, maybe even lift up a shoulder and move it closer. Your palms can be facing up with your hands on the floor or try clasping your hands under your back and bringing your arms even closer to each other. And then you're getting a big stretch, not only along your spine, along the front, in the center line, but also from your left shoulder up across your chest over your right shoulder, keeping the strengthening of your glutes, lifting your hips high, keeping the engagement of your low belly, and then let a huge breath inflate your lungs and let it go. And to come down, if your hands are under you, move them out of the way. And you're going to undo from the top down. Don't just let your, uh, your bottom go to the floor in this um, arching position. So undo from the top, lowering down one vertebra at a time from the top to the bottom. Then you'll have your back on the floor for a moment before you relax. And let it go. And just take a few breaths there. Again, I remember the first time doing bridge pose. And I kind of felt like my chest was sinking down into the floor after that big lifting up. Once your back is on the floor, then you can move your head any way you like. So you breathe in here, and then you can bring your knees into your chest. We'll do a spinal twist to finish before the relaxation. So let's let the legs go over to the right. And then you can extend your arm out to the left. If your neck feels comfortable, you can look over to the left. You can put your hands, your right hand on your left knee. And if you want a little more stretch, try stacking your left knee right on top of your right knee. Your arm, your, your back might come up off the floor a little bit, but that gives you a deeper twist. So in other words, your left hip is moving in one direction and your left shoulder moving in the other direction for the twist. Notice how this creates a nice opening for air to come in in your upper left chest. And now to come out of this, the arm that's out and extended, bend it first so you don't have as long a lever to your shoulder joint to pull back across. And roll onto your back. Notice the difference between your upper left chest and the upper right chest. And then roll over to your left side, maybe stacking your knees. Left hand on top, right arm reaching out of the cross. 
and looking over to the right if your neck is happy that way. Otherwise, you can just look up at the ceiling. So, in a yoga class, when you're practicing with other people, and the teacher's leading you, you get to a certain point, and then the teacher says, okay, time for relaxation. I like to, in my classes, leave a little bit of time, because everybody's different, and there might be something that your body needs before it's willing to let go. So, we're going to roll onto our backs and do a little self-assessment. Do you feel like you're ready to just relax now? Or is there something else you need? If you're ready to relax, then you can just extend your legs out long and start in. I'm going to show you in a moment how I like to set up the final relaxation with Shavasana, the corpse pose. However, you might be feeling like, oh, my back still feels a little tweaky. Or I wish I had a little more mobility in my hips or I you know, want to do something with my neck. Or if you're someone who's been doing yoga a lot, um, you know, maybe you're going to do a shoulder stand or something. So you want to do a little self-assessment, see what it is you might need, and try to give yourself that. If you're in a class with a teacher, you might call the teacher over and say, you know, can you suggest something that would help me to feel, you know, like, I feel like I have tension in my feet. Is there something I can do? Because um, you want to be, as much as possible, ready to just slide right into the letting go. So you do whatever it is you need to do, and then you're either going to just, the classic Shavasana corpse pose, is your legs are slightly away from each other, arms slightly away from your body. Most of the time, your toes are going to be slightly dropping to the outside, but maybe not for everybody, just whatever's comfortable for you. And your head is heavy on the floor, and you're just resting here. This is the classic Shavasana. The version that I like to do incorporates some support for under your legs. As I said before, it can be counter cushions or regular cushions. Maybe it's just a little cushion under your knees so that you get a little um, relief in your low back. Again, that angle that I talked about in the very beginning, if you can set up that angle, it's a nice way to be in the Shavasana. So I like to use a bean bag and have my legs at about an angle like this. If you use a couch cushion, you can have your um, shins parallel to the floor, but maybe you're still creating this angle. But it is nice to have something supporting under your thighs. So if you have a bean bag, go grab it. And then either a nice soft sheet, or maybe you've got a beach towel, or maybe you're feeling a little cold and you want a nice warm blanket for you. As I said before, if you are practicing with somebody else and you can have um, someone put a blanket on you, and then maybe the last person has to put it on themselves, but it feels very nice to have a blanket put on you. And then finally, uh, an eye pillow. And in my studio, I use the tissue and then the eye pillow, because then it keeps it cleaner if you have your own personal eye pillow, then of course you don't need the tissue. So you're either lying back on the floor, length stretched out, or you're propped up somehow, and you've got yourself covered up. Your arms can be underneath the covering or out, however you like. And you have something covering your eyes to keep the light out and provide a little pressure over your eyebrows. So we'll take a breath here, come back to the very beginning of class, just noticing when your brain is signaling the need to breathe in. When it says, okay, time to release the waste products, breathe out. And just let that happen over and over. So you're going to stay where you are. And the ultimate challenge for uh, yoga, really, is now that you're not thinking about a pose and the challenge of trying something new or trying to balance on one foot or something like that, what happens in your head? Do you all of a sudden just start to get on the hamster wheel? So just know that you can practice this, and it will become 
easier, just like you practice downward dog, and you'll get stronger. The same, you're just exercising a different kind of muscle. So Shavasana is at the same time the easiest pose, because you're just succumbing to gravity, surrendering. And at the same time, it's the hardest pose. Because you have nothing in the way of your thoughts. One way of handling this is you could do a body scan, starting at the top, relaxing around your eyes and your face, feeling your head releasing onto the floor, feeling all the places where your back touches the floor, softening and melting, feeling your arms getting heavy on the floor as all your arm muscles relax. Be aware of whatever is under your legs, whether it's a support or the floor, and allow your legs to release into that. And then feeling your whole body as one unit, very lightly floating up as you inhale, and as you exhale, sinking back down into what's underneath you. If you're comfortable here, I recommend you stay longer if you can. I will just talk you through how to come up out of Shavasana. You can do it with me or do it later. <clears throat> you'll begin very slowly, very gradually to take in a little bit more air each time you need to breathe in comes around. And then start to be a little more forceful with the exhales, a little more complete. Exploring all the air. And then some kind of movement just might spontaneously come to you. If not, a lot of people like to start with moving fingers and toes. And then letting that movement ripple up the joints. So you can start with moving your toes and then your ankles and then your knees and then then hit your hip joint, bring your knees in. Likewise, moving your fingers and wrists and elbows and then moving at your shoulder joint. And maybe you take a full body stretch, reaching your toes in one direction and your fingers in the other direction. Created a huge amount of space in your lungs and fill that up with air. And then pull yourself in to a small little ball as you let that air go. And then you roll to your right side and stay there for a few breaths. You can use your right arm as a pillow. If there's not something else nearby that you could use to prop up your head. And then to come up to sitting, you'll put your left hand in front of you on the floor. Again, paying attention to your breath cycle and use an inhale to come up to sitting. And then if you can, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Yoga has always been the preparation for meditation. And maybe you sit quietly for a few breaths and in some comfortable way. Maybe finding that angle between your torso and your thighs that I talked about in the beginning. Using a block or a cushion or a chair. And again, just noticing the effects of your time here today. And those of you who actually were beginners today, welcome to the yoga path. And I hope you can always remember the first downward dog. And the rest of us, try to get back there as often as you can. Remember that yoga is what's happening inside. And 
hopefully it's something good. So thank you for being here today. Namaste. Remember the special thing in me sees the special thing in you. And I hope that you are able to enjoy some of the other classes that I've done already. And maybe you're going to follow this channel and be alerted when I'm putting up new things and join me live, if that's possible. And I would love to hear any feedback about this or any other classes. And also, I would love to hear recommendations or suggestions for things that you would like me to cover. So, um, you know, maybe I'll do a session on meditation or if someone wants to do a session on advanced arm balances or um, going upside down, whatever it might be, I would love to make this what people want. So thank you for being here today. Namaste.